<laughs> so thanks for thanks for being here. I think I was invited as a long time open source developer and founder of the own cloud project and co-founder of own cloud in the company around own cloud. But um, I actually want to talk about not really about own cloud, but about the few interesting concepts and trends that we see in the industry, which are at least in our opinion very very important for the future. So uh, the topic is next generation cloud capabilities here today. So um, first thing I want to um, discuss with you is actually what is cloud, right? Because as we all know, cloud is a quite cloudy term. Everybody understands something different under the term cloud. What I mean here at this talk with the term cloud is cloud file sync and share services. So um, if you look at this picture here, um, I think this describes best what we understand here at this moment with the term cloud file sync and share. Let's say I have a computer here in, in, in Europe and I have my laptop, desktop, something, and I have a folder here on my desktop and I store all my files that I want to work with in this folder. Um, but I work together with someone in Japan. Um, that's like a, one from a different company, some collaboration between universities, something. And everything I store on my local folder automatically, magically appears on the folder on the other side of the world of the guy in Japan. So this is basically cloud file sync and share. Um, so um, most of you might know this concept from services like Dropbox or Google Drive or iCloud, I think. Who here in this room is using Dropbox or Google Drive or iCloud? Okay, I would say nearly everybody. <laughs> so later in this talk, I want to discuss, I actually want to understand what your IT department, what your privacy officer, what your CIO actually thinks about this, that you use consumer services and um, what this means for the security of your data. <laughs> That's a uh, topic for, uh, for in a few seconds. So um, these services, these file sync and share services on the cloud, there are different ways to implement that. There is like what we call the first generation. So this is, uh, this is uh, like a centralized service where we have, um, where we have in the middle like, um, like a spider in the middle of a net, you have a centralized service somewhere on the internet, usually operated by one entity, by one company, and you have all these different users, all these different clients basically connected to the central service. So let's say in the middle there is like something like Dropbox, and I'm connected to Dropbox, and my collaboration, uh, collaboration partner in Japan, as I said earlier, is also connected to that. So you can easily sync and share files. Um, well, the deal is easy, just upload all your data to Dropbox, and then you can have the sync and share features. That's a deal basically here. And that's of course very cool because it's so easy to use. It's very, uh, you don't have to care, right? It's in the cloud, magically happens somewhere. You don't have to care. And that's very good. Obviously, there are a few problems here. Um, so um, one problem is the centralization here. So I don't know if you checked the news this morning. This was actually interesting because this morning a, a story broke that six million Dropbox accounts are, are leaked. So uh, <laughs> the guys who raised their hand earlier who use Dropbox, you probably want to use your, uh, change your password right now. And so <laughs> this is, of course, one of the problems with the centralized solutions. Then there is user provisioning, right? If you use it, if you use Dropbox inside your company, inside your university, then can the IT department actually change a password of a user? If you forget a password, can the IT department help you? Um, can the IT department lock down or uh, shut down an account if someone is, you know, is leaving the company? Right? Uh, how does user provisioning work here? Then speed. I mean, obviously this works very well if you synchronize and share a few files, a few office files, that's not a problem. But let's say you're in your search, you're a research facility and you deal with petabytes of data. Well, and we have these nice local networks which are really fast, 10 gigabits and so on. So, well, does this mean that I have to first upload every single file to the US somewhere so that my colleague next door can download it to actually access it? That's a bit strange, right? Then cost, right? It's, of course, very affordable, but if you have a big enterprise, you have thousands of users, and you have petabytes of data, then, yeah, it's, cost is not so 
not so good anymore. And then data protection, of course, right? This is whole privacy aspect. We have actually data protection laws in lots of countries. And what does this actually mean if the data is stored somewhere else? Um, is it still legal? Which laws actually apply to the data? Lots of interesting questions here. But wait, hey, we have good news, right? So we are an open source conference here, right? So we can, we can write some tools. So we can fix this. So it's possible with the power of open source to create cloud software um, which enables people to store the data locally. So um, this basically means that you can have your own local Dropbox on premise, wherever you want. So this then is what we call the second generation of, of cloud software. So you basically have a picture like that, which is um, similar to the first picture, but you don't have one central cloud instance, like there are lots of individual ones. So every institution, every company, every soccer club, every com enterprise, everybody can have their own local cloud services. All the users can connect to those services, and this is very cool. So it's on-premise, it is very secure, because you control the policies, you control the software and everything here, so that's very nice. It is flexible, you can integrate it with your other services, software, whatever you have in your enterprise. Um, it's of course fast, because it's all local, right? It's don't have to transport over the, over the half of the planet, right, to just share stuff with your guy next door. That's very cool. Um, and um, there, are no, there are um, no data silos, <laughs> sorry, um, which means that you can actually integrate in these systems um, your existing storage. You can integrate your existing Windows network drive. You can ex um, integrate your existing SharePoint. So it's not creating another Dropbox or Google Drive data silo. It's actually leveraging your existing um, your existing storage. And of course, open source. Well, this can be all done with open source software, which is very nice. A few examples are OneDrive Pro from Microsoft, not open source, but still provides this functionality in own cloud, of course. So that's all cool. But it's not so easy, unfortunately, because what this means in reality is that IT departments and users, they have to choose between having the convenience of the public clouds, right? you can share between the planet, between different users very easily, or you have the security to have everything local, because the local ones are relatively isolated. Right? So that's the problem. You have basically, you have to choose between those two paths. And this leads us into the, what we call the third generation, which is something like that where we have local on-premise cloud services, but they can actually talk to each other. So there's actually server-to-server -server sharing, where one person on one cloud can share something with a guy in a different cloud, right? So let's say there's one university here, and there's a big enterprise on the other side, and someone is running a cloud service at a, at a Raspberry Pi at home, and they, can all, they all have this shared folder, as I said earlier in the first slide, so it's very seamlessly but it's still distributed. So this is very nice. This combines the, the benefits of this public services with the on-premise solutions. Um, they can talk to each other with some open protocols. That's very nice. Um, and the administrator can basically choose where the data is physically stored. That's very nice. The question here is, well, okay, that's nice. So we all talk to each other. Well, what does this actually mean for security? I mean, why is this more secure than the very first generation that I shared earlier? Because we obviously have some kind of Nash network here, right? some distributed cloud. So what about the security here? Well, the security is then what leads to the full picture of what we call the third generation distributed clouds. Because we introduce a concept here, or we need to, have, we need to introduce a concept called file firewall, which means that the administrator of these different domains, one administrator of your university, of some company, someone, can actually apply some rules, some, uh, some policies um, to their local cloud storage. 
So something like, hey, I'm happy if all my users share their files with the rest of the world, but not certain file types, or not something in a certain path, or I'm only give this server-to-server -server features to a certain LDAP group. So only a certain, a certain user group is actually allowed to do certain things. Or they can only access it from, different de from, from specific devices that I have to, they have to approve manually, right? So I'm only um, basically um, allowing sharing um, with, I don't know, special uh, authorized uh, tablets that I decided. Um, or time, or location. I mean, I can decide that, well, every share automatically expires after five days right, for security reasons, and so on. So this is what we call the third generation distributed cloud architecture. So the summary is what, in our opinion, is really needed for the future is cloud file sync and share services that can run wherever you want. Just to be clear, this can be run somewhere on a, on a public cloud infrastructure if I decide to, but then it's my decision. If I decided that I want to have it in my own company, my own hosting center, then I, I want to do that on premise. User provisioning, I want to decide which user accounts work here. Um, I want to leverage um, existing local storage. I really want to leverage the maximum performance. So I don't think we want, we want to copy everything around the world only because it's called cloud. Right? Then distributed, we want to collaborate, work together. Firewalled, so I want to decide which rules actually apply to my data and obviously open source. Thank you. So, for the second part here, I actually want to invite my, my colleague, Marcus Rex, with an awesome panel to the stage to uh, dive into these uh, topics a little bit more. Yeah. Hey. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. This was uh, very interesting. So we wanted to actually go a bit deeper into some of the, uh, some of the ideas that Frank uh, spoke to us about. So first, why don't we just go around and introduce ourselves a little bit and talk about what interesting um, projects we have in that uh, space. So I'm uh, Markus Rex. I know some of you here. And uh, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of OwnCloud, the company. Roger. My name is Rogier Spohr. I'm working uh, in the Netherlands at SurfNet, that's a national research network. We run the network and we have about uh, one million users uh, there. So my name is Kuba Moschitski. I am from CERN. I am a ser storage service manager at CERN. And we are, well, at CERN we are doing science, as you, as you know. And we are currently looking into adding this file sharing and syncing capabilities in our environment. And maybe we can later evolve on that. Hey, Peter. OK, good morning. I'm Peter Segadi. Uh, I work for a community, which is the association of the European research and education networks. So those uh, organizations that primarily serve higher education and research here in Europe. Hello, my name is Raimund Vogel. I'm from the University of Münster in North Rhine-Westphalia, so this federal state of Germany. And we are currently setting up a uh, cloud sync and share service for the academic community in North Rhine-Westphalia. So that's a prospective 500,000 users using this service. And we will start that uh, at the beginning of next year. So that is an Im impressive number, Raimund, to, to put out here. When you um, think about this, I don't think there's any other, I have not heard of any other project of uh, that size of like a self-hosted uh, half a million user cloud instance. Um, what, is, what are some of the uh, problems you had to overcome to make something like that happen? 
Oh, so uh, the universities in North Rhine-Westphalia, they are not, uh, well, they are independent, but they are state-funded. Uh, and we had to get together this consortium of now around 25 universities that they are willing to participate in this service, to find the agreements, to govern that, and also to uh, create trust amongst our future users and co-operators that this could be a, well, um, a secure service, a service compliant with German uh, data privacy legislation and uh, also of course a, um, a service that will be accepted by the user community. So we did extensive surveys on that to, to see uh, how uh, to position the service and how to motivate people to use it when, uh, once it is uh, available next year. So, um, thinking about this, Peter, you said that you um you work for a community. Would it have been easier when thinking about what Frank showed us with the distributed uh, cloud, where sort of participation is a little bit voluntary compared to what, uh, uh, what Raimund said about, you know, get everybody to agree and some things. Um, do you think that in a future world where there is uh, a distributed voluntary cloud that this would be an easier path towards getting everybody connected? Um, yes, uh, we are facing with a challenge, basically, uh, that education is global, research is global, and we have this, this notion that we, we try and treat our users wherever they are, just like they have never left home. So it's, it's, it's pretty much like the, uh, the approach of my mom, right? She, she wants to treat me that I've never left home. So that's, that's, that's pretty much the same here. And, and you know, being a mother, it's not a, that's not an easy thing. It's challenging. So there's a huge distributed community around Europe. They are collaborating with overseas, with, with, with Asia, Pacific, the US, um, the Americas. So um, uh, serving them with, with the services they are used to in, in, the, in their home environments is quite challenging. We have this example of EduRome, for instance, if you heard about it. So EduRome is the, uh, you can basically access uh, all kinds of local wireless uh, networks, uh, distributing the EduRome Society and participating in this collaboration with your home credentials. So reaching something similar with, with data storage and, and file sync and share would be, uh, would be really challenging. The... Um that's actually an interesting, uh, interesting point when, when you say that this would be a real, a real challenge. When you, um, what, it is, what is it, what, what problems would you have with existing, you know, nowadays solutions that you can find out there of this first or maybe even second generation cloud services? Um, what are you lacking there that you would need to make this less challenging? Um, one of the biggest challenges, I believe, is, is um, service verification. So we have to build services uh, with the notion that the end user should be able to verify the service that he's getting. So if I'm requesting for a service, uh, it should have the abilities as built into the architecture of the service that the end user is able to verify um, the actual service attributes, which is not there in, in, in terms of uh, public cloud services, for instance. So if your cloud provider promises you that the files will be stored in Europe, all right, how can I verify that? There is no such a way where you can, uh, you know, uh, get that information out of the cloud. And that's what we're trying to solve with public, uh, some sort of private cloud um, offerings. But again, there, if you build up walled gardens around all kinds of uh, services in different domains, that's going to help our global community. It's kind of interesting because, you know, um, the challenges that we are facing actually are uh, related, but are slightly different. So with, at CERN, what we're trying to do, you know, we are an organization like many others. So it's around 5,000 people, and we have different departments and typical issues for organizations with different departments for using this kind of <clears throat> public cloud services. So, you know, a financial department, HR department, we don't want people to store some files somewhere else. Uh, but what's actually, uh, let's say, very specific to, 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 to what we try to do at CERN is we are trying to see how we can enable this very easy file stick and share uh, way of working for, to do easier science in our very sophisticated physics environment with 
more than 10,000 physicists in more than 200 uh, institutes worldwide. And this is challenging because these are very sophisticated IT users most of the time. They are excellent scientists. They have very complicated ways of analyzing the data, accessing files. We have all infrastructure in place to replicate files, to um, store them at very large scale. And the challenge here is really how you enable this very, very easy, zero setup access to this kind of service. And of course, the environment is extremely heterogeneous because, believe it or not, but if you come to CERN, you are free to choose your operating system. <laughs> so actually, we end up with having all sorts of operating systems you can imagine. And to support this kind of thing on such a heterogeneous, uh, in such a heterogeneous environment is very, very challenging as well. I don't envy you on that one. <laughs> 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 the, um, when, you, when you think about the, um, this heterogeneous en environment and, and everything that uh, you have to do to support that and support all your your users that come with the expectations. You said this actually very nicely yesterday when we, uh, when we had dinner. We said, you know, all the users actually want is they want to have a Dropbox-like experience everywhere. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to sort of type in anything. They just want it to work and, and um, of course, have a phone number to call if it doesn't. Um, but they want it to work exactly the way they want and not how you want to do this. Is there anything you can give to, um, to vendors out here in the, in the various cloud spaces, I'm sure we have a bunch of them in the room, that um, you know, they should be doing different to make your life easier running such an environment? You know, at CERN and in general in high energy physics, we are very good at getting Nobel Prizes, but yeah. we are very bad at designing interfa user interfaces. So, you know, something that is probably pretty obvious for, to most of the people here, we are not very good at. And actually, the, the major key sell, one of the major key selling arguments is that for such a service is that it's perfectly integrated into the desktop environment. It works on Windows, on Mac, on Linux, on all pos in all possible platforms in a completely seamless way. So, I don't have a particular message to the vendors right now. But um, just keep in mind that, uh, well, different communities are good at doing different things, and what you are trying to do is to put together these different best capabilities of different communities and provide some service that would be unique and serving well our, in our environment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for our setup, of course, we have things that we, we do not find in a commercial product or in an open source product like OwnCloud. Um, probably we, we will never have a chance to find that uh, right away, so we have to do it ourselves. And that's things like enrollment portals for having more or less zero effort uh, self-enrollment by our users. So when you go for a scope of 500,000 users, you don't want to mess around with, uh, with uh, dealing with each user registration. You have to uh, keep uh, support efforts down by making your service operation transparent to the users, like uh, doing uh, monitoring of system availability and proactively informing your users of system outages of, and of, uh, of uh, system availability conditions. So this is all the thing that, uh, things that we have to do um, well, ourselves as add-ons, and so it would be nice to have, uh, well, probably packages for that that we could easily integrate. Of course, there is uh, um, Nagios and also distribution set up on Nagios that add to uh, add features like uh, multi-site availability monitoring. But this is currently a thing that we are dealing with. It's interesting. Um, Anything you yeah. have to share with any yeah. problems you... you we, yeah, this en enrollment of new users, this, that was also a key thing for us when we decided to uh, start our own service build on uh, own cloud. But we liked to use our own federation service. So all our universities, polytechnics, uh, academic hospitals, they are all connected to our federation service. So they have their own uh, identity system, but they are connected to one one central federation in the Netherlands, run by us. 
And what we have done is we have just connected the own cloud service with our federation, and then all users can just directly uh, log in to the own cloud service, and they will get redirected to their own institutional identity provider. So they will uh, uh, um, log in with their uh, familiar uh, environment, and then get redirected back to the own cloud service. So in this way, we don't need to really provision users. They can just well, get direct access to the service. And this was for us a very convenient way in, uh, in offering the service to all institutes in the Netherlands. And you know, I have a feeling that at CERN we are going to get back to the roots because sharing is part of our culture. And let me give two examples. So uh, all results of scientific research that is done at CERN or using CERN facilities is open for public and free. Okay, so there is an explicit policy for that. Uh, there's also a lot of attention given to giving uh, to enabling first-class access to data and to, uh, um, let's say, analysis facilities for researchers from all the countries. Because we have a worldwide users and we really see that for some people in some countries it's much more difficult to do science than for others. Okay? And uh, um, the other example is that actually, you know, World Wide Web was invented at CERN and it was invented exactly for that reason, to enable and to make it easier for scientists to share information. So with this kind of project, and also about federation and about all this kind of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, collab collaboration with these multiple clouds, I feel that we are coming back to the roots. So we are sort of you know, where, where we started, and, but now we can really give it in a much more interesting way to people. But I, I think at CERN you are one single administrative domain. So the main challenges come when, when different administrative domains should talk to each other. And that's the area where I believe we need open standards. And actually this cloud standardization activity is still lagging behind because of the, uh, the, the, you know, the current status of the industry. Um, and, and the cloud economy, I would say. So I think I'd, I'd just like to em emphasize the fact that we need open standards and we should, we should work on things, how different clouds can work together. And this interoperability can be, you know, from the architecture point of view, it can be done at the infrastructure level, can be done at the application level, or can be done at the service level. Uh, Rohi already mentioned the access federations that we are working on. So it's a very good uh, example of uh, you know, interoperability at the service level. So we can allow uh, students or researchers or staff using their home credentials to access uh, services. Um, we're experiencing with some cloud interoperability at the infrastructure level using you know, pr various protocols. Uh, we haven't really seen yet any major inter uh, interoperability at the application level, and that's what really need, and I think on cloud is in a good, good path to, to achieve this. The, um, you actually mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, open standards in the cloud space. The, um, it is actually an interesting challenge when you think about this. You have, um, you have these big, Frank called them the first generation cloud services. Um, when you have them, they are sort of run by commercial entities because although it might be free to an end user, it's certainly, you know, you don't get sent hard disks just because you want them. You have to pay for them. Um, so you have to make some money in some way, shape, or form. The way how this is being generally done these days is try to get as many people as you possibly can and lock them in and don't interoperate because if you interoperate, you sort of give away one of the, uh, one of the most a priced commodity, which is a user, because the user might actually change. Um, I wonder how that, how that is going to pan out, and I hope that um, some of you guys here with some of the projects that are doing that are, you know, ap approach this whole challenge in a very different way, can actually make a uh, sort of be a little bit groundbreaking and, and force people to be, uh, be more open about their, the way how they're interacting. That would be, I'm really looking forward to seeing some things on that front. Um, let me ask you another uh, question because I'm sure we have a lot of people in the audience that, um, you know, are thinking about, you know, building up some of their own cloud services or do something. What would be, when you think about your projects and how they evolved, what would be the prime learnings that you had and what you should be really, what, what heads up would you like to give people of like, 
re remember this so you don't run into any, any big or major challenges. Who wants to go first? I'm sure all of you have plenty of stories that go way longer than the time we have. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, major challenges. Um, um, well, well I, I think in the end, why we have chosen own cloud was because our universities <coughs> were already moving to Google, to Microsoft uh, 365. Why? Because it, it's, it's just free. I mean, yeah, it's an easy choice, it's free. But then they had concerns about data, then they thought, okay, we must address this, we have also uh, security concerns. That's the reason why we have set up this service. And uh, well, what's important right now for us is to, to reach out to the end user, to the individual, the, the student, the teacher, and make sure he will use our service, because he is already using uh, Dropbox. Uh, he, he's also using uh, Google Drive, he's a uh, Microsoft uh, One. Um, so, so the challenge right now is how to convince that end user. And I think uh, it's just, part of it is in the user interface. It must be very, and that's, uh, I see lots of improvement there, even in the OwnCloud 7. So that will definitely help. And the other thing is make sure that in the own cloud system will be very valuable data for, for researchers and, and students in su such a sense that they just will make use of the system and get familiar with it. So for us, the main, uh, really the main challenge was to integrate this service with existing storage systems. Because what we want to achieve at the end of the day is that all this makes a complete coherent picture. So people who are currently doing analysis and producing some analysis files, like histograms or other files with this kind of data, they put it into the existing storage system, and then it's automatically synced, if they wish so, to their devices. So enabling this sync and share capability in, the existing, in the, our existing quite sophisticated data storage system, this is the main challenge for us. And also, with this comes, you know, some other technical issues like really m assuring that file system level tree consistency of directories and things like this, which are well, well beyond what you typically get in the Dropbox, simple Dropbox use case. I, I work with the community, not directly with the technology. Uh, and if you're commercially minded, the user is the king from, from your point of view. But in the research education area, the, the users are just, I mean, the students are monsters and then the researchers even worse. So they try to, you know, uh, they don't care about their own privacy. privacy. They don't really uh, care about how they store the data. So the real challenge is on the user side to, to provide them services which then, they, you know, have the assets and, and protect them uh, in a way that it, it should. Um, so for us, uh, well, the, the key uh, uh, factor for success of this project will be that we don't handle it as a so our uh, big uh, cloud storage project for for the state of North Rhine Westphalia is uh, that we don't handle it as a technology project, but uh, as a well marketing uh, effort and also uh, um, we, we, we put a, a, a strict focus on trust. So cloud services is a, a big deal of trust. Uh, you have to convince uh, users that you're better, that you give a benefit against available cloud services, uh, publicly available cloud services, and uh, that you can do better than that. And uh, so you have to see what uh, users want and you have to address their needs and so this is our main focus. Technology can be done, there are people who can do that, but uh, to, to focus the project on user demands and on trust is uh, for us the main focus. So I think if I, can, if I can sum that up, um, what's really important is you have to make sure that you pick, the, pick up the users where they are and get them, provide them a path of very easy usage and if you don't do that, you know, and if you aren't able to do that, don't, don't try. That's what it sounds like a little bit. Thank you. I hope this was interesting. And we could provide some, uh, some points to you and, and give you a little bit of, of hints of what's going on. Thank you, guys. This was a good panel. Thank you. Thank you.